I'll start again. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Mayor, fellow councillors, staff, the press and visitors. Any apologies? None. Extraordinary business? Declarations of interest? Confirmation of the minutes? Page one. Any alterations? One, two or three? If not, somebody would like to move those minutes be received. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Seconded, Councillor Urquhart. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Contrary, carried. Just one thing in the minutes, Mr Chair, which is not covered later, and it's just a question, really. It's under 6.12, roading subsidised. The last sentence says the average lifespan of a road in the Ashburton district is nine years. It doesn't sound long. It could just, the question is, is it correct or is it a certain type of road or all roads? Just a little bit of explanation on that statement, please. Bottom of page two. It's under 6.12, roading subsidised. There's a paragraph there, and the last sentence in that paragraph, it says the average lifespan of a road in the Ashburton district is nine years. True or untrue, or explain. Uh, well, the roads are out there. They've been there for 50, 60, 70 years in a lot of cases, so I'd say that the average lifespan of, is well in excess of nine years. Um, if they're talking the ceiling, it depends entirely on the surface of the road and how it's been surfaced and what type of um, surface you've put on. Uh, if you go with a grade six chip, for argument's sake, and you just put it on a base course, you, life would be somewhere in the vicinity of four, possibly six years. Uh, if it's a grade three, five, uh, two, two coat chip seal, uh, we would expect somewhere between 12 and 15 years, given normal traffic loadings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in some instances, if you've only got 200 odd vehicles um, a year going across that particular pavement, uh, it could last 30 years before it becomes brittle and starts to fall apart. So uh, I don't know where that fig particular figure has come from. Mr Chairman, should we remove that sentence then from the minutes? If it's not deemed to be accurate? It was part of the presentation by Jeremy, I think, with the... doesn't appear to be accurate, though. Or does it? What does the chair, the manager of service, the oh, uh, Through the chair, it's probably just a big average over all the, the roads, and uh, it, it can only be seen as that. Um, yes. Well, at 5.1, Moronan Road. Questions of Mr Firth? Moronan Road guardrail. Uh, Councillor Brown? Just one question. If we put that rail on, will the width of the bridge be the same or will it be wider that people can drive on? The actual road carriageway width will be slightly wider. Uh, that's what we're going for. Um, under the current railing situation, it is about 4. Point, or just under the 4 uh, metres across. I think with the Guardrail, the way we're anticipating it, it'll be out to the 4.12 metres, which is the um, normal standard for a one-way bridge. No further questions? Councillor Ellis? Thank you. If there are no further questions, um, I would take great pleasure in moving this recommendation. This bridge does have a very Bridge does have an unfortunate history, and I do feel we, we need to be doing something there, so I'm happy to move recommendation 5.1.2 as Second to Councillor Lovett. Yes, I'd like to second that, and I know there's been two tractors through that bridge as well, and I think I think it's timely that we did something about it, so I support it. Second up. Any further discussion? Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I too am happy to support the recommendation. 
Um, my question is for Mr Firth. I know that this issue came up at the Road Safety Committee um, and I'm pleased to see the prompt action that's been taken. I have two questions. Uh, one is in relation to the illustration itself that has imperial measurements, and I'm wondering if that's standard for our current uh, mapping. Um, and second question, how will this information feed back to the Road Safety Committee? How will they be updated? Um, from the point of view of updating the Road Safety Committee, meeting will just come back in and indicate that uh, the bridge will be made safer by having the guardrail barriers put on, um, not to the maximum that uh, the standard would allow, but to a standard that will prevent cars in particular going through the barrier into the riverbed um, and widen the deck uh, or carriageway space in such a way that uh, it, there shouldn't be any problems with uh, slightly overwidth vehicles and things of that nature. You want the right to reply, Mr Councillor Ellis? All have heard the motion. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary, carry. 5.2, welcome Mr Guthrie. Beach Road Water Main, reconsider. <coughs> Questions of Mr Guthrie. Councillor Urquhart. Yeah, I have a question or two here uh, through Mr Chair to Mr Guthrie. Um, in the report, there's no comparisons to other water schemes or projects that have been um, done to, you know, to, get, to actually get a value of what each um, uh, user or developer should, should pay per connection. Um, my question is, is there is another project being done which the... Um, landowner is actually paying 100% for, and that's down Johnson Road, Johnson Street. Well, <clears throat> um, I guess my question is, is where's the fairness of somebody paying 100% against somebody actually only paying, well, them grouped together as, as 10 persons in, in the report or 10 connections only works out to be 20%. Yeah, so through the chair. Um, well, unfortunately, some of these developments are going through on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, I think my understanding of the Johnson Road one is that the, there is only one developer there and the opportunity for uh, other people to be uh, benefiting from that work is, is quite limited. Um, so that, uh, that property was... Uh, well, that approach was taken in that instance. Um, in this particular one, um, there are a number of beneficiaries um, and our analysis sort of indicates that a reasonable level of development is about 40, uh, 40 properties. So under those circumstances, it's appropriate to treat it a wee bit differently um, and look for a council, council to act as a banker uh, and recover that over, over a period of time. Councillor Eric, you've got a... S supplementary to that. <coughs> the, the Johnson Street, you say there were no other beneficiaries, but... There's a residential sea alongside that, and I can see there's probably maybe 10 beneficiaries there, um, as well as another uh, property, I believe, would like to connect to it as well, and there's been a, quite a major figure uh, put on that uh, for him to connect. Um, if I can refer to other schemes, um, some of them, you say there's an extra 40, which is in the information here, or, or it's actually 40 in total, I think. Um, if I could use the Wilkins Road one, if there's 26 could be beneficiaries, or it could be to subdivided that 26 could benefit from that, which would then mean the council, uh, if they charge the same as they've charged the previous ones, would... Um, be actually making a profit of $70,000 on that scheme. So I guess where I'm coming from, I, I, I believe there's not a really fairness in this. I think um, um, I'm certainly not opposed to it going down Beach Road, but I think we have to uh, get all our ducks in a row and be fair to everyone on this. It seems a wee bit one-sided. 
Um, well, if I may, so in terms of when we look at these, uh, as I say, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, as officers we are looking at the affordability of um, uh, these developments. Um, uh, for the analysis I did for the Beach Road one, it looked, the, the figure we ended up with looked on par with um, very similar approaches we'd taken elsewhere. Um, certainly the Wilkins Road one, um, it was in that order. Uh, of magnitude in terms of the contribution, uh, and Tate's Road, Glassworks Road proposal, that was very similar as well. So w as officers, we're fairly comfortable that we are in trying to bring an element of fairness to it. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, the only other option would be to start building this infrastructure um, ahead of development, um, and the whole, you know, the, the whole scheme pays for that, and we try and recover it as we go. Um, but we, we typically, as a, an approach, um, we're prepared to react to development uh, and just deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. It allows us to cut the cloth to suit the, um, the circumstance. So supplementary to that as well, if we go to um, the fi financial implications, um, you've got here a lump sum payment of seven thousand um, <coughs> uh, dollars, which um, that was over uh, eight properties, and you say here that that's seventy thousand dollars. Well, eight um, eight times seven actually isn't seventy thousand dollars. It's actually only fifty six thousand. So maybe there needs to be a recalculation there. So second, <coughs> secondly. The cost to put this scheme in at the cost to put this scheme in at two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. That's three hundred and thirty dollars a meter, roughly. Um, I think there needs to be some uh, pencil sharpening on that. I believe that's um, rather expensive, and I'd like you to comment on that as well. Okay, so uh, first of all, my apologies. There is a typo in that item that says eight properties because originally when the developer came back to us, he had confirmed eight um, and then there was a subsequent update which brought it to 10 connections. Uh, so that's just simply a typo in the report. Um, in terms of commenting on the, um, uh, the, the, the other matter, um, I... These, these developments are, um, we're, we're trying to be agile um, and it can be quite, uh, quite tricky to respond um, accordingly. Um, in terms of the, the cost implications, well, this is only an engineering estimate at this point. Um, we still have to go out for tender and get the work procured and it very well may come in uh, well under that number. We, we simply don't know. Um, but these were based on the construction drawings at the time um, there were some matters around that construction that made it a wee bit trickier than we expected. We were hoping to be in the, in the actual berm of the road, uh, but it now looks like we're going to be on the shoulder, um, and that pushed up costs as well. Councillor Price. Thank you. I, I wonder if you could uh, tell us, uh, just carrying on with the financial implications, the, the remaining $210,000, what measures do you have in place to ensure um, the, the recovery of that sum, rather than hope that it'll be uh, recovered and possibly leaving ratepayers in the lurch? Um, so the, the approach is typically that it will appear on our fees and charges schedule, um, and we would basically effectively count down until we've recovered the, um, the required amount. Councillor Brown. Thanks, Mr Chairman. I've got two questions. The first one is um, the properties that don't connect will be, and the pipeline goes down the road, let's assume that, will be getting a half charge. Are they aware they'll be getting a half charge or will it be news to them when it turns up on the erect demand? No, so th th this has been through a, a formal consultation process um, which we looked after the first time round um, and all of that information was made quite clear to them. Um, they're aware of our... Um, rating implications. They're also aware of the the metering uh, regime that we would apply to the to the connections. It does say there that there's five that didn't respond. So 
they may not be aware, or would they be aware? No, no. We contacted all properties on the uh, on the section. So they're all aware. Yeah. In, and the second question is that this, uh, if the pipe goes down, you're putting potable water down there, and these properties get subdivided, will they be needing wastewater services as well in the future? Uh, well, that, that's a matter for later. Um, but yeah, I mean, eventually a lot of our development planning we're doing is in preparation for that extension of the residential C um, area uh, and eventual servicing of that. Um, at this point, the residential D development that we're, that one of the properties is, has done recently, um, they will have to do on-site disposal at this point. But for the longer term, bigger picture, you are thinking wastewater too at some stage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, part of the the ARS project uh, is to provide a, a gravity solution to this area uh, at some point in the future. Adam Mayer. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Through you to Mr Guthrie. Mr Guthrie, on the report at the bottom of page 10, we talk about option one, proceed with the uh, extension. And the risk that you have got in italics is council may receive criticism for the imposition of water rates from property owners in the area that do not support the water main extension. Is there a second potential risk that council may also receive criticism for the road having, having been dug up recently? And has that happened since March? I, I did not witness it myself, but I, I heard indirectly that the road had already been dug up and it wasn't included in the first report. Uh, look, I'm not not familiar with that. I'm sorry, Councillor Ellis. Just um, wondering why we can't use that nice wide grass boom that's there, and we have to go into the hard shoulder part of the road. As I take it, we don't own the boom. And uh, no, so uh, typically what we're looking for when we're looking for uh, service alignments is a, a clear alignment, um, c continuous for the whole of uh, the full length. And unfortunately, there's some uh, cabling and what have you in the way that basically has prevented that. Well, my question is, 75% of the cost will be stood by council, and it could be on the Never Never land. The 40 obviously won't have to pay, the proposed extension won't have to pay the half rates because they're not in existence yet. The developer himself is not going to connect. He's just using us as a bank to put in for his development. Um, Tate's Road and that, we didn't supply 75% of the, the money or outstanding money. And I see on the, the, the first page, intend to connect after five years. Well, the, the 40 section development hasn't even started yet. I mean, it could be 10 years away, 15 years away. And in the meantime, Ashburton or the district water ratepayers will be standing. It won't be the district as a whole. It'll be those that are connected to town water, be it in Hines or Ashburton or wherever. So I'm in the hands of the committee. Somebody like to move one way or the other? Councillor Urquhart. Can, can I uh, move a motion or, or recommendation uh, that the construction of the 150 mil water main and beach road of approximately 850 metres be put on hold until a fair and equal costing is established in line with other projects? <coughs> I'll second that motion. Councillor Evely. How you interpret and with other people, but the, the bulk, the, the push, the, the main thrust of the recommendation is that we put this extension on hold. Mr Chairman, may I seek clarification from the mover and seconder? Are you suggesting that Council should be developing a policy to have consistency across the handling of these extensions? Absolutely. It must be consistent and fair to, fair to everyone. 
Councillor Brown. Mr Chair, um, listening to Andrew sitting here and explaining what is going on, um, I have got a feeling that it is fair and even to whatever the job is. Not every job is the same, so some jobs might be quite a bit cheaper than other. Is that correct, Andrew, as I understand that? Yeah, so as I said previously, it, we, we cut the cloth to suit the circumstance. Yeah. Thank you. So I can't see a reason for this whole motion. Councillor Lovett. I was just going to ask if, um, aren't we in danger of putting this whole thing on hold, that you're going to have other houses being built down there having to supply their own water wells and sewage and that, and they're not going to come on to this in the future? I mean, we, and with the three waters review, we've got a supply where everyone's got to have good potable water. And if everyone if starts um, building and putting down septic tanks and wells, the underground's going to eventually become polluted. And I thought um, we're supposed to be looking forward and um, looking at our infrastructure and, yeah, and, and building it with, the people, with these subdivisions in mind, because the town is going to grow. Yeah, well, uh, the, the purpose of uh, what we're endeavouring to do is provide something ahead of that development. Yeah. Councillor Price. Thank you. I'm, I'm tending to agree with Councillor Lovett. I think um, the, the town is going to grow. It's, that's something we know for sure. Um, we've had a go at this before. They, they've come back to us, so I think they've provided more information for us to make a decision on. Uh, the cost of this is only going to increase as we go on. And if, if we've got a surety that we will recover that money inflation adjusted, I see no particular reason for not going ahead with it at the moment. No further comment? Sure. Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you. I'd just like to add my comment too. While I see um, Councillor Urquhart's point, I'm in agreement with Councillor Lovett because I think, and I've always have, had the view that at these developments that are happening close to town, we need to have as many connected to the town water as we can because looking forward, um, they're going to have to eventually be there and I, I tend to support the motion for those reasons. Councillor Brown. As Councillor Urquhart says, we seem to be have different rules for different areas. Have we got a policy on this at the moment? On what we should be doing? Uh, no, there's no guidance, uh, policy guidance no. in this space at the moment. No. So Councillor Urquhart's asking for this to be put on hold, if I got it right, and for perhaps add the words in, uh, waiting for a policy to be developed. But didn't the motion actually say that? To, would no. we like to read the, no. the motion, no. Tania? <coughs> Yeah, that's it. That's until, until, until fair and equal costing is established in line with other projects. Should we be more looking at policy rather than costings at higher level? Councillor Brown. I go back to what I said before. I think the costing has been done as, it, as the projects are and the percentages will be the same, isn't it? So at the end of the day, every development will get paid. So what is the problem? I think Councillor Urquhart's problem is there has been s extensions done that have been paid solely by the person who, the developer or the person who's put the water in themselves. So we haven't got a policy that every person or every developer wants an extension. The council says, we'll do it and you, as long as you've got enough people to, to um, pay a percentage of it back, we sort of ad hoc that it depends on the circumstances and the percentage and all sorts of things like that. I mean, Buckley's Terrace, virtually everybody signed up when they put that in. So, I mean, that was quite simple. But so, Mr Chairman, with the mover and second, I'd be happy to add the words at the end of their motion pending the development of a policy. Is, is that where we're heading? Yeah, pro probably would be. Probably what we're looking for is a policy to be uh, fair for the developers and the staff. Because at the moment, moment we're pointing the finger at the staff to say we aren't quite happy with this. And probably developers are out there saying we're not quite happy with, with we aren't getting the same treatment. So it'd be nice, nice to think that no fingers are pointed, we've got the same thing. So we're looking for consistency of a policy which develops. I think we've got to the stage 
we've got to decide whether we go ahead with this particular one or not, and if we don't, we recommend that the council develop a policy regarding water extensions. Is that, is that the way I read it? Um, Councillor Lovett? I, I, was gonna we'll have to I was going to say that was the way I was reading it, and I think we have to go ahead with this one because if we start looking at policies, it's going to, the time it goes through, it could be a year or so away, um, the time it goes through. And I, I think we've got to deal with what we've got here. If we've got these people on board now, we've got to kind of honour them and go ahead with it. <laughs> Councillor Price, one last. <laughs> Appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I, I totally agree that we need to be consistent in how we approach these things. Um, but I think, if I understand Councillor Brahms' point correctly, what the point he was making was that we are being consistent in the end result, which is that those individuals are paying 100% of the cost. It's just we're approaching it differently for each example and the examples that Councillor Urquhart has given each of them seems to be a different circumstance in themselves so what are we being consistent with the bottom line is 100% cost being paid by those who are connected Councillor Urquhart you've got the right of reply we'll have to call this debate to the end yeah I think the point's being missed a little bit what, what we're really trying to get at is, is the fairness um, the Johnson Street person, the, the, as I said, there could be 10 or, or 15 more people joined to that. So why does one person have to pay for the full project? Um, to equal it to the Beach Road one, theoretically, you should perhaps only have to pay maybe 20% of it. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking for fairness. Don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed to water. I believe council should pay for all schemes and then have a rating system that actually balances out and, yes, it will be paid for in time by users, but... Um, and this is where the policy needs to be. On a situation-by-situation situation, uh, assessment is, is not acceptable to me because... What's the difference between Johnson Street, Wilkins Road, Murdoch's Road or Beach Road or Tate's Road? They're all the same scenario. So uh, I, I find it difficult at this stage to accept the Beach Road proposal when Johnson Street's being charged or the developer there is being charged 100% uh, of the cost. Right, the motion, will you read it again, please? If I can just get the word. Okay. So the motion is that the construction of a 150 metre water main in Beach Road at approximately 800... <coughs> I just can't read there. 850 metres be put on hold until the fee and equal costing is established in line with other projects. Right, you've all heard the motion. All in favour? Mr Chairman, can I just clarify? I thought I asked the mover and seconder if they were happy to add and the development of a policy, and I thought they agreed. Okay. In line with other projects and the development of a policy. I thought that the mover and seconder had agreed that they were changing those words. Yes, we've added that, yes. Right, all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary? No. I'll ask for a show of hands. All in favour, please raise your right hand. Two, three, four, five. Five against. Motion is lost. So, will somebody want to move the original motion? I will. Mr. We don't Chair. need to debate it, we've debated it, so you'll move I'll, it, Councillor Brown. Seconder? I'll, I'll second the motion, but I'd like to add uh, number four and a policy be developed. Yes, yes. Are you agreeable with that, Councillor Brown? Yes. I will say yes, but I can't see the, the reason for it, because on the moment it still works out, everyone pays for the water they're getting. So, 
to keep the peace, I will say yes. Like you've all heard the motion. It's one, two, and three as written. And four. number four, that the council develop policy yep. regarding the construction of... Yep. I didn't hear a thing. The wording of the... Which policy, Councillor Brown? We, we need to do develop a, um, a water main extension yep. policy, mm. perhaps for water and wastewater, because one will tie with the other. Councillor Brown, you put your light on. You Sorry, no. But I reckon, yeah. Right, Point four is what I was quite happy to add on to it. Yes, thank you. Right. No discussion. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Contrary. Aye. I'll declare the motion carried. Through the chair, can I just get clarification? What is the policy? Is it water, wastewater and water main extension? Extension, extension which will be outside the town boundaries because inside the town boundaries it's all sorted. It's yep. the outside. It's water and wastewater. I think wastewater should be in as well because um, they'll go side by side. Yep. Yeah, I think what Councillor Brown had in mind that when we put in a water main, we should consider uh, fibre optics and a wastewater pipe, perhaps not side to side, but in the same trench, because then in the future we don't have to dig it up again. Isn't that the Right, number six, activity reports. Somebody would like to move activity reports be received. Yeah, Councillor Reveley, seconded Councillor McMillan. All in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carried. Welcome, Jill. Library, questions? Councillor Price. Thank you. Um, to you, Jill. Um, under the... I'm skipping all the way down to the uh, end of year performance. You make the note that there are fewer class visits. Why was that, please? Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I understand one school that normally, or used to send uh, quite a few classes, uh, has now decided to use their own library exclusively, which, which will change the situation quite a bit. Further question? You got yes. anything to yes. add at all? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Councillor Mayor, Madam Mayor. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you to Jill. Jill, recently I had occasion to meet with the Rakaia Library, and I'm wondering if you could just help me understand the relationship between our Ashburton Public Library and the small rural libraries that are out there, and and how they work together. There's, there's three small community libraries. Uh, they're all totally independent of the council, except that they receive a cash grant with which to buy new books, and they receive from... They're able to come in and choose loans of books from the library stock. Uh, really, that's... There isn't really much more relationship... They come under the community grants now, so they're not actually administered straight from the library any longer. That was the case till about three years ago. Councillor Lovett. I was just going to ask the books, the library, um, sort of too far, um, they go out once, you know, they leave the library. Have these small libraries got the opportunity to um, have first pickings or get any of these books for their libraries? Because it would help them, I think, and their readers. Rakaia has, has taken some children's picture books and also some large print books. Uh, by the time they're um, cancelled from our stock, they're pretty well worked over. And I wouldn't like to think that these libraries were relying on you know, old worn <coughs> books uh, to uh, to service their their client their subscribers in two cases, 
So um, I don't really think that that's, that's a particularly fruitful source of, of book stock for them. Oh, Councillor Brown. And you may well be right, Jill, the book's getting a bit old for them to use, but also talking to them at the Rakai Library, there is a limitation on the books that they can get, so I'm led to believe, as out there loaned from the Central Library here to Rakai anyway, because I know about that, is they can't be any younger than one year old. Um, they don't want young year old, one year old books, they want access to the new books as well, the same as people here. Is that true? That they can't have them less than one year old? Yes, that is true, and that's why the council give them a grant so they can buy a certain number of new books. These libraries are only open for several hours a week. So I think you've got, they're not really a public library operation. So um, I think to, to use, to, to have our brand new books going uh, out there and being behind closed doors for most of the week, I, I don't think it's a very good situation. And that's why that restriction's been put on. Councillor Rebley? Yeah, just a congratulations on uh, the way the holiday program run. I had some grandchildren go through there and uh, the parents that, that watch what's going on are so well presented and the way that, that they, they run really well to the age of the children. So, yeah, so they, thank you for, for entertaining them so well and they were pretty happy when they come back home. So just keep up the good work. Councillor McMillan? Thank you, and I was going to say the same thing. You've done a great job with your holiday program, um, but also the new Facebook page and the new app that you have. The app's really easy to use, and I suspect you won't have as many people bringing in books um, or late books for fines now because it's just so much easier to renew your library book. Oh, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Through you to Jill. Um, Jill, we've recently had a visit, in fact, just this afternoon, from Andrew Coleman, Heritage New Zealand Chief Executive. And he had occasion to come to the library and he was hunting for a brochure on the Heritage Trail around Mid-Canterbury. Um, just wondering if you could help us understand how are the brochures going? And he mentioned that we have a few social services up there but not Heritage Trail stories up there. How are they going? Are they being well used? And who is the greatest audience that you have coming in? Uh, the, the brochures are updated uh, by Experience Mid Canterbury. Bruce Moffat comes in and I think does a good job of updating them. If there's something he's missing, um, perhaps uh, he could be contacted or, or provided with those brochures. I think mostly it's overseas tourists. I'm, it's a bit hard to tell because we, we, we only um, talk to them sort of on a one-off basis. So, yeah, a bit hard to know what they are. This time of year, possibly less so. It could just be tra people travelling through. Thank you, Jill. Ashburton Museum. Tani, welcome. You got anything to add to your report? No. Questions? Councillor Ellis. Thank you, and thank you, Tanya, for your report. Just under 6.2.2, caring for collections, and it seems to be a, this is one that crops up repeatedly as we get our agendas. It's a very similar story here. When all the items came over from the old museum, was there not a full inventory done at that stage? Or are we going right back to the beginning and trying to, to, to relist everything from, from day one? Um, because there seems to be a lot of time and effort going into this one, and I just wonder if you are working to a time schedule. And also, um, I believe there's some talk around the, the library at the moment houses um, the old copies of, our, of The Guardian, and are they coming across to the museum? And if that's the case, how are you um, positioned to take that? I believe at the time of the building of that uh, 
that building. Um, there were some racks put in there for newspapers and, and the proper storage for those, but I was just wondering if, if there is a large amount of work in, in that one as well. Okay. I think in terms of the inventory of the collection and updating catalogue records to be adequate for staff to do their job fully, it's going to be several years of work. At the moment, we're just simply looking at the volume of work required. So I can't account for how an inventory would have been carried out in the past. Um, I certainly did see a newspaper article from maybe around about 2009 or 2012 that said that a full inventory was um, taking place. Um, I can't account for that article. On the second question, um, I can say that no, we don't have any shelves that are deep enough for the um, bound newspapers. The view of the staff is that those newspapers are available in a number of formats. One is digitised, and that's the most po popular format for people because they can go online and they can search, and um, National Library are progressively putting more of those newspapers up online, and, and it's searchable. Uh, the second um, part of that is that the very best copies of those are held at National Library, so there's a full series there. Um, so for us to store in a format that is very seldom accessed would probably not be a good use of council resource. I certainly couldn't build a business case for that. Supplementary. Just, just seeking clarification on your inventory. All the items in the museum, are they owned by the museum or by the trust? And just, is no. there a trust that owns all so items? Historical. So the, the Historical Society Trust, I believe, own. Yes, so through the chair. Um, the Ashburton Museum and Historical Society own one collection that we manage. Um, that's got about 20,000 objects, about 6 million photographic frames, about 5,000 maps and plans and more than a kilometre of archives. Then we have Ashburton District Council archive, and that includes the predecessors to this council, so the borough and the county council as well, road boards and so forth. Yep, that's probably another 600 metres, so about 1.6 kilometres of archival records. Councillor Price. Thank you. Um, Tanya. First of all, congratulations to your staff on the Spirit of Budo, the, the activities around that. A number of us here attended the, um, the opening of it and that was uh, most enjoyable. Um, and congratulations also on, on the exponential rise, looking at the performance update, the exponential rise in visitor numbers. Um, going from last year's result, it's almost a 25% increase, which is quite, sorry, 20% increase, which is quite phenomenal. Is that, my question is, is that sustainable on the staff um, at the moment? Through the chair. Um, I guess we need to find out. If you mean if, if growth, it, I think it's about an 18% growth, 118% um, on that previous year. Um, obviously, we're in significant need of more resource. Um, I would definitely say that the focus, the work that is required on the collection just to make the collection practical for staff to access for resources, for researchers, is absolutely huge. Like for example, less than 5% of the collection have a current location allocated to the item. So if you don't know where it is, that's really hard, especially when we're talking kilometres of shelving. Um, and in terms of the interface with visitors, uh, certainly uh, school holidays, we saw people coming in. We had our busiest day ever um, over this past school holidays, and we saw families sitting on the floor to do activities, and that's really common now at the museum. Um, so I do think that we're reaching a critical point in terms of um, the service that we can continue to provide and certainly to grow. Further questions? Thank you, Tania. EA Network Centre. Richard. Richard, welcome. The boss away at the moment. 
You got anything to add to your report? Uh, no, I'm happy with the report. Questions? Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you. Um, I think I have asked this question before. Was um, Some time ago we passed an amount of money to have a new, what I thought was a massive blow-up type play toy, for want of a better word, that was going to sit, I presume, on the netball courts. How far, and I was told it would be after the 1st of July in the new funding year. So how far along the pathway of getting that are we? Uh, yeah, through the chair, correct. We've, the design is completed, it's been ordered, and it was I was told it was 10 weeks of construction. Um, it was ordered about 8th, 10th of July. Um, so I'd expect to see that mid-September, ideally before the next school holidays is kind of what we're aiming for. Thank you. Look forward to seeing it. Councillor McMillan. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, how did your... You said in your report you had a good turnout for the... Um, school holiday program. How many children did you end up having and what did you do? Um, yeah, through the chair, we, so for these holidays we took over the, um, the existing Sport Canterbury holiday program. They'd run a holiday program for roughly 25 years um, and it's, it's been very successful. Sport Canterbury's mould was to stop running them and, and farm them out to other, other organisations. Um, we've taken it on and we've expanded it from one week to two week per holiday. We average 37 kids per day. Um, the activities, we've expanded on the activities as well from not just sport but now a wider range of recreation activities. So um, there was a bus trip that went to Christchurch, they went to the, the Air Force Museum in Christchurch um, and there was uh, working with Eco Educate, Leslie Otte from e Eco Educate um, and various other activities that were, were part of it as well and we've started planning the October one already with more opportunities for kids. Councillor Malcolm. Uh, yes, um, for you, Richard. Um, so you say the gym is well utilised, um, and you've got an increase in numbers there. Uh, is this due to the um, initiatives that you put in with um, challenges, monthly challenges? Uh, it seems to be through the chair. It seems to be due to a lot of reasons. The challenges definitely are bringing people in. Um, winter also brings a lot more people in, um, but just proactive measures to try and keep people coming in the door uh, to utilise the gym is, is keeping it as busy as ever. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Thank you. Um, Richard, how's the floating movie night? How many people? You said the 117. How many, how many nights were, was it? And are you going, do you have any plan to do it again? Through the chair, yeah. We, we had 117 turn up to one night, so we held it on a oh. Friday night. A usual Friday night would have between four or five children coming in for swims. Um, so by holding it on a Friday night, we got another 100, 110 kids in the door that evening. Um, it is something we're going to look at again in the future and possibly with some other activities around it. Um, no, date, no date set as of yet, but certainly something we are going to look into. It was very well received. Mm -hmm. And um, supplementary to that, um, is it financially viable for the... For the um, doing that all the time or you know regularly doing it through the Did chair it's, get returns financially yeah definitely we didn't we, we had no additional staffing costs mm -hmm. um, so so there was a little bit of cost around a movie um, licensing costs and that mm -hmm. kind of thing but um, it definitely was viable for us to, to run it again in the future cool. thank you and just along those lines so from what you said I'm assuming you just charged the normal entry fee for the child into the pool complex, there was no additional charge because there was a movie on? Uh, through the chair, we charged $5 per child rather than 4 um, So a slight increase to cover, the, cover those licensing costs and such. Councillor McMillan. Thank you. Just a question on the end of year performance update. So your, um, oh now I've lost it. Uh, the swim school, so it's down due to lack of or shortage of instructors. How are you going? You correct. With that? This, through the chair, there's two, there's two parts to that um, that numbers. We are struggling to find instructors um, to come and teach learn to swim, and we continue to recruit. The other side of that is we've seen a really large shift of of parents moving children to individual lessons rather than group lessons. So if you imagine you've got six children in a group lesson normally and then a parent wants one child in an individual lesson, that still takes up that tutor's time and reduces the capacity by five. So 
it seems to be a really popular option for parents at the moment to do individual lessons over group lessons, and that's brought our numbers down considerably. I think this is interesting because in the long-term plan, we're actually planning to extend the pool for learn to swim, and if the numbers are down, it may be, even if you can't cope with it, why would we put in another pool if the numbers are not going to be there? So the, um, the flow-on effect of parents moving children to individuals means that the wait lists grow out a little bit longer and we haven't got the pool space to add additional classes nor do we have the instructors at this point in time. If we had the pool space and we could find the instructors then there is definitely still room for growth within the swim school. Councillor Brown. Uh, just on the performance measure of the gym, it's, the gym is well utilised and it's um, 1,634. 1,634 what? Through the chair, that's 1,634 people who have access to the gym or group fitness facilities through their membership type. That's 1,634 memberships? Correct. Right. So you'll get casuals on top of that or not? Correct. Um, gym casuals don't tend to be a very popular option, but they, you, you do still get casuals on top of that, correct. Right. And how much space is left at 1,634 memberships? How much, through the chair, how much space in the gym? Yeah, yeah how many more can you take? Capacity. Not many, we're at capacity. We're, we're, the gym is a very full space at certain times of the day. Um, if, you, if you went to the gym at five in the evening, there's not a whole lot of room to move. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Through you to Richard. Richard, uh, again on the end of year performance update, this time in regards to EA Network Centre is well utilised. In 2017-2018, the results were 482,908. In the 18 19 year, it's 454,953, which, on my calculations, is approximately 28,000. So uh, the comments there are the numbers are down due to close downs in both the pool and the stadium. And I'm just um, seeking could you remind me, please, what the close downs were and could you assure me that we're going to have less close downs next year? Through the chair, the close downs were at the start of this year. We closed the pool area for two weeks to do repairs to tiles and, and the pools. Um, that came to roughly fifteen to twenty thousand visitations that you could lose during that time frame. Um, again, we had a two week um, close down in the stadium to add the curtain dividers, um, and whilst immeasurable, that still had another large effect of uh, of attendance. Um, the other thing that we haven't had in the past year, the indoor bowls and, and large tournaments were actually in the previous year, so our numbers were really high. We haven't had any large-scale events in this year, but we're about to have some more again soon. We've got basketball tournaments coming up, so those large-scale events that bring in tens of thousands of people at once, we haven't had any of those in this performance measure. Councillor Malcolm. Um, through you, Mr Chairman, just to comment to help um, Councillor Brown... Um, and Richard, I uh, attended the gym at lunchtime today and there's plenty of room for Councillor Brown to take a membership out, right? So, there. Thank you, Richard. 6.4, open spaces. Welcome, David. Six point four one. Expert and District <coughs> Biodiversity Working Group, I guess Councillor Price will, is involved with this as chair. You got anything to add, Mr Askin, to your report? Um, oh, just uh, regarding the biodiversity, I've heard through the group, fine, that's a couple of people have put their nomination for the Pesley Asian Committee with the Regional Council. That closes tomorrow. Uh, no, nothing else to report there. Any questions on open spaces, including biodiversity parks or public conveniences? Councillor Lovett. I was just reading here about um, you know, um, upgrading some of the, painting some of these um, park benches and things. Is that extending to the ones in your spare time, extending to the ones in East Street? Because the ones at each end of the green down Farmer's End and up the railway station end, I mean, they are a bit of a disgrace, especially when you see overseas people sitting there eating their lunch 
I saw the other day, and I am a bit embarrassed. They are look, looking tatty, you know, because they're not going to fall into the um, centre of redevelopment. Can we have a bit of work on them? Whether, you know, it's just sprucing them up or colourful or doing something to them. Um, well, yes, they have actually had some work done on them, um, and that happened. Um, it was about six, seven months ago when um, there were some broken planks and that and we went through and, and cleaned them up but um, I guess uh, you know they're always going to be at some stage um, getting lichen and all that because they're under the trees and uh, they, they weren't painted they were cleaned and washed and, and repaired. Okay. Councillor Price. Thank you and just as a follow-up to that um, I noticed as we drove past in the bus yesterday that there's one at the skate park that's got the planks completely broken. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering whether that was more a case of misuse and whether you've actually identified misuse of those um, in the skate park and whether it's a good idea to actually have one there. Um, no, I hadn't noticed that. But the skate park, the one at the skate park, I understood was going to be looked after by the people who look after the skate park, and they would take responsibility. They actually wanted the seat there, um, and the whole idea was that they would take responsibility of looking after it. Thank you, Councillor Malcolm. Uh, yes, sorry, Mr. Chair. Just more of a comment um, regards to the Lake Clearwater hut holders cleaning up the um, wild wilding pines. I was involved with that with the uh, biodiversity officer Bert Hoffman's um, on that day, and it's great to see the buy-in that we have now from the hut holders right in that area and looking after the plantings that we've done. So just just a comment. Thank you, Councillor McMillan. Thank you. Um, through the chair, just a couple of questions. Um, one, the uh, Camrose playground in Methven. I think I asked this last meeting, but any update on when the playground equipment will arrive there? Yeah, I hope to have it in the next couple of weeks. I've, I've really been working, well I was away for two weeks in July, but um, we've been back again on the guy in Christchurch. I actually had a ring from the supplier when I was in Melbourne, um, wanting to know how it was going, and I said, well your person hasn't put it in. Um, and so we've got things rolling again, so yep, it's, it's been this, the the supplier, no, or the person who's putting it in, so that us down in Christchurch. Oh, okay, thank mm. you. And the other question is on the new Methven Dog Park. So I know we had a question um, at the community board meeting on how it's going to affect the workload in Methven, um, and I know it'll add a bit of a workload to it. But how do you see it all panning out? Will it just need to be mowed every? Um, yeah, well, certainly there will be an extra workload, and there's 1.4 hectares of area to mow there that's for the start. Um, there's trees to be looked after, there's hedges to be clipped, and there's infrastructure to look after, and there's rubbish bins to be emptied. So, yes, definitely there's going to be an input <coughs> um, on our service delivery <coughs> up there. Councillor Lovett. I'm just going to ask about um, toilet signage. Um, look, every time, a lot of days you come into town and there's people parked up in Tunwell doing their business behind trees. Can we get some signage up there that toilets are, you know, a K down the road or, and even, because the Heinz people were, had been asking that out there to direct people, because I don't know what's wrong with this generation, they just seem to stop wherever and perhaps we need to put some blatant signs up, there is toilets available. Well, you'll notice, um, maybe you haven't, but um, around the whole of the district where we've got rest areas, um, we've put up signs to a map to show where the nearest public conveniences are, where the nearest recycling area is, um, and, and a board, basic board of information of what is near to them. I'm not too sure what else we can do. This is in areas where people stop, and um, we've given them the information of where to go, etc. Councillor Brown, you Thanks, Mr Chair. Dave, congratulate you or your team, whoever put the application into the Tourism Infrastructure Fund. You're obviously very successful in getting that, um, that amount of money, which is great. The plans out there, out there now have been developed. Um, the lines are on board with it. And I've talked to the CE about now informing the people of Rakaia through their little newsletter as to um, what's going to happen out there, how logistically you're going to remove old toilets and put new ones in and just how it's all going to work so they can 
get the uh, feel for what's going to happen and how it can all work for them and end up with a, um, a fantastic upgrade to that um, site out there. But the congratulations on the success. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of, there's a lot of pre-work to be done before we actually start. We're still waiting for the um, formal uh, documentation to come through regarding it all. Um, but from then on, yeah, there'll be a lot of extra consultation with the people in Rakaia, with uh, the landscape plan and um, having a timeline to go through for the demolition, etc. Yeah, there's still a lot of work to go before we start. Councillor Reveley? Yeah. Light. Uh, two questions. Uh, the Mount Summers fire shed, at the uh, toilets at the fire shed, is that ever going to have uh, official t uh, council sign that there's a toilet there? I thought there was actually a sign in the car park that's pointing to it. There's a sign that the caretaker put up a little cardboard one sitting, sitting, sitting there, but there's no official part of that. So, yeah, certainly there's been some complaints lately that people have been in there and using the bushes. So, I just wondered about that. And the other, the second question is, um, there's there's one counter in the Mount Summers Reserve. Um, is 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 it that's supposed to be operating, or is there going to be counters put into the Mount Summers Reserve to count those four toilets? There's one there at the moment on a uh, on a woman's toilet. So. Is there any plan to put a, put counters in there? You're saying there's not counters here at present? There's one on the woman's toilet. Right, yep. One, one, um, one counter on four toilets. Yeah, but there's a... We, we don't do all the toilets. Like, you only do one toilet, and we can get an idea from that of how many visits the other toilets. Off you. Pro the, the problem is the, the, the most, most of the people are using the, the campground toilets and this is, this is on probably the poorest quality one and uh, if you're slightly handicapped you can't shut the door so uh, if they could be put, put, put them put on the woman's toilet in the campground you'd actually get a quite different figure. So I'm just wondering, is, the, the question's been asked a couple of times, is, is, there going to, is, is there a counter ever going to be put on the toilet that's usually used? Well, understand that we don't look after the toilets in the Mount Summers camping ground. It's not a, officially a, a public toilet that's looked after by my department. And we have the same down at um, uh, Rangitata Huts. They're, they're camping ground toilets. They're not public toilets. We have the same at the Timor Domain. There's public toilets here. But the camping ground ones are looked after by the camping ground caretaker and the public can't use them. Councillor Malcolm. Yes, Mr Chairman. Um, regards to Rakaia Sevens Tales toilets, a dump station there at the moment. Um, there's quite a bit of con congestion around that site. It's, um, you've got a playground, um, you've got camper vans going in, they back in behind the existing toilets. And we've got a EV charging station in that place, let alone we've got the Salmon Tails traffic. Um, I'd like to think that we had the dump station could possibly taken away from that area. Right? Is there a chance of that, um, for that to be put somewhere else? Um, I think you'll find that Mr Guffrey's working on that present. Uh, they don't have any funding for it, but they are looking at um, some way of uh, assisting with that. Councillor Price, please um, ring, have relevant questions. We seem to be dragging the meeting out and out. So I know it's quite relevant to ask questions, but we seem to be... <laughs> Councillor Price. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope my question is relevant. Uh, looking at your performance measures, um, the one where urban residents live within 400 metres of a park or open space, you your current result is 95%. So what policies or measures do we have in place to improve that? What, what do we need to do as a council to improve that result? So what we've got to look at is when any development are happening within that area, and one of the areas is East Ashburton, which is down towards Trevor's Road area. When that gets developed, we need to look at getting some neighbourhood parks within that area to give the the 400 metres of being able to walk in that 400 metre radius, okay? That figure there of the 95% actually takes in some of the school grounds. And I um, I know it does in like Rakaia and Methan. Um, so 
because it's based on parks and open spaces, we see the, a, a school ground being an open space. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chairman, to David. David, I'm just looking at, uh, again, the year-end performance and Council responds to parks and open spaces, failures and requests within medium response times. And the narrative there is um, issues experienced at the beginning of this year with signing off CRMs have now been resolved. The target was 100% and you met 54. Um, just seeking your assurance that it's completely ironed out and next year we'll be on track for 100. Okay, yeah, um, and I'm sorry, it doesn't look good on us and I'll be the first to admit. Um, we experienced some problems originally with the signing off, but we weren't going a, a further step. Um, we've had a number of discussions among our staff regarding this. The, and we even looked at it as setting up a, a, a flying squad, if people can remember the Sweeney TV show, the, the, the flying squad, um, and to go around and do all these things. But we felt that it wasn't the best use of resources. So what we do now is that we have a program and some things don't get done um, within that time frame because there's no point in going out and doing that and coming back again. And a lot of things are, are based on like trees, um, and, and most of our ones are, the higher percentage is trees. And so what we do is we look at a number of trees and we have it on a program and we'll go and do that all in one go. It is past the time, but we don't sign off until the job's actually been done. And that's why we have this bad percentage. But we're aware of it and we're trying to work on it. Another one's like um, the cemetery, when you get wet weather, you get graves sinking and um, you go and fill one up and then you may get a net, another wet day and then you'll get three or four or five. So we try and work in as a program and go and do a whole lot in one stage rather than do one and go back and do another one. Okay. And second question please, in regards to the cemetery, it's nice to see the tidy up work and the tree planting has commenced. Just mm. wondering if there's an update on when that extension will be open. <laughs> Uh, we haven't got a date at this stage. Um, there's still some remediation work to be done by ACL, which will be done in the spring. Um, we're not happy with some of their work, which I've got to replace. I still want to sell the plots that we've got left over in the old section, because if I open up the new one, we'll be left with plots in the old one. The last time I checked, which was probably uh, about a month ago, we still had uh, around about 60 plots left in the old cemetery. So that's what I'm at at this stage. Councillor Ellis. Thank you. Just going back to your CRMs and, and your explanation, which I, I liked, if, but, but if you get a CRM, do you respond to the person to say, look, yes, we know that now know that tree's a problem, we will put it on our work schedule and we anticipate it will be done approximately within the next three months? Because to me then... That's actually meeting your target. You don't, I'm not expecting you, if someone complains about a tree, to rush out and chop it down tomorrow, but responding to the complaint, I think, is the important people and opening that line of communication. Yes, we do. Yep. Yep. I'd say nine times out of ten, we respond straight away to let them know, either by phone call or they get a letter from the CRM um, system. There are some that we have to be done in 24 hours, um, like toilets, um, etc. And they are, we meet all that criteria. But it's the ones that we have, uh, which is 10 working days, and um, that's where we, and I've been through every individual one, cross tick, and, and um, that's the pattern that I've sort of found out. Mm. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, while we have David here, my question is in regards to stock water, and no, I'm... We we've got oh, on, okay, we're sorry. just coming on to that now. OK, righto, we'll go to stock order. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and David, great to see the end of year performance. Um, great to see that all the targets have been met. Um, I read the narrative that says there's been a steady number of stock water closure applications received and processed. I'm wondering if you could just enlighten us into how many kilometres of stock water races have been closed. Sorry, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um... It's getting, well, obviously it's getting less and less, but no, sorry, I can't give you exact. Um, at present, we have got um, five sitting on the table. Um, there's two big ones, or reasonably big one, one really big one, um, and 
that's, we've sent surveys out on that at present, so uh, we're just waiting for the surveys to come back because we haven't got 100% agreement with the closure of that race. Um, others are just minor ones, um, shifting a race because uh, irrigation or, um, uh, yeah, it's probably the main one. Councillor Reveley? Yeah, which, just which like, again. yeah, just like to know, now the irrigation race is down, we have no stock water again, it looks like the water's going into the irrigation race, there's nothing here on that, and you've probably had some washouts with the thing, so um, some of those minor maintenance things, uh, are you going to be able to get water down our road again, do you think? Well, I've always had it down there, I'm sure we'll get it back down there again, um, I'm not 100% sure which one it is, sorry. The, the middle right, the middle middle race, which is uh, the irrigation ditch is down, so it looks like it's putting the, the pressures, the, all the water's going into that. So that's actually, while the race is down, I, I know it's not on the thing, but we're not making much too much headway. Uh, no, 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 you're paying for stock water, and there's no stock water at all, and this, this race will probably run for the next three, two or three years now. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue there that needs resolved. Councillor Brown? No abatement notices, no infringement notices, no enforcement orders, no convictions. That doesn't help the farmer who's got the sheep or cattle who want to drink the water. I don't think the result reflects the level of service that we want to deliver. Um, as Councillor Beverley said, he's got no water down his race, but here it's not mentioned. Uh, I think we've got the performance measure and what we're aiming for not right, not aligned. Your comments? In the bylaw, it says that we don't guarantee water. Um, we do our absolute best. Um, and, you know, we, we do have problems with particular intakes that get washed out and being able to get water. And sometimes it takes a few, well, sometimes it takes a week to get water down to the far extremities. But, uh, yeah, some of those things um, are, are um, I suppose, are acts of God. That's that's acceptable. It, it is. It doesn't always get there, but you're not reporting any of that. There's no result. Uh, through, through the chair, my understanding is that we can amend the, um, the annual uh, measures via the uh, LTP process. So when we next come to do a long-term plan, uh, we will make a note of the measures that could be improved. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Thank you, and I was just going to ask if we received any CRMs on stock order because there is no reporting on that, but maybe that's how we're going to deal with that one. So um, just another question, though, as well as how much um, distance of stock water racing we've closed, how many QMEX of water have we returned to the Ashburton River, do you know? It just might be timely to, to have that out there with some of the things that are happening around people's consents and that at the moment, so to show that we are doing our part. I can't give you that answer off the top of my head unless Andy has a better idea. Um, I know we've reduced our intake by a considerable amount, but to give you a percentage or amount, I'm, I'm sorry. Councillor Price? And just as a possible answer to that, my understanding is that we met the target that we were set, with the target was to be met by 2023, we met that target last year, 2018, but I can't remember exactly what our figures were. It may be even better than that now, because we've been closing races. Right, well, everybody finished with stock water. We'll have a 10 minute break for a cup of tea. Obviously, we're not going to get all the way through. So we'll, we'll come back here at... Um, 17 minutes to th four.
create a lot of discussion, there's nothing, and then the most yeah. random thing. Yeah. We put a lot of new signs. He's got his thumbs up. Righto. We'll resume. 6.6. .6. Solid waste. What? Yes, it is. Oh. Yep. We're back. Welcome, everybody, back. 6.6. .6. Solid waste. Welcome, Craig. And your other engineer. Shamal. Shamal. Anything to add? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Questions? Councillor Reveley. After the Fox River, is this uh, the piece around that old landfill going to be uh, sort of it's stronger than you originally managed? R originally managed it was going to have to be? Are uh, you referring to the southwest slope in the, on the old Ashburn landfill? Yeah, we've got um, <coughs> geotechnical engineers, Tonga and Taylor, at the moment working on some options for us. So had a number of discussions with uh, Environment Canterbury about how to go about it. Um, so, they, yeah, they've asked for some more information and some more options, and uh, I think they, they may be interested in contributing something towards that as well. Um, so we'll see how that goes uh, um, over the next few months. No further questions? We should have had a cup of tea a while ago, then. <laughs> Anything about end of year performance? No comments? Three Waters Capital Projects. Thanks, Craig. Sorry to keep you here so long for so little. <laughs> 6.7. Welcome, Andy. Shamal again. Questions or anything to add? Nothing to add, thank you. Councillor Lovett. I was just going to ask you, doing the boarhead risings, um, what's the time frame to doing all those? You've started obviously on one. Um. Yep, through the chair. So we have started on Argyle Park. Um, that's the first one. I think it's called uh, Argyle Park Board 2. So it roughly takes about uh, two weeks to do each board. And uh, the next one we are doing is on Walnut Dev. So we're expecting, um, I think we're in total, we are doing uh, seven balls. Uh, two of them are slightly different, where we need to actually drill a few things. So that will be done in uh, September, October, because we need specialist contractors from Crashish. Apart from those two balls, we're expecting all of them, the other five, to be completed in the next one or two months. <coughs> Councillor Ellis. Thank you. Just on the um, Chalmers Ave, I see you've got the comment there, the mains have been commissioned and final reinstatement of Chalmers Ave is expected to be completed by the end of July. So it, what's been done, is that the end result now or is there more work to be done on Chalmers Ave? So related to that project, we have completed uh, laying these sewer lines. Uh, it was completed uh, a week ago. Um, and reinstatement was done last week as well. Um, we have not issued practical completion um, yet, but that will be done soon. Um, in terms of this project, yes, we have completed it, uh, but then um, there will be more renewals uh, projects further down at Chalmers Ave and then into Cameron so, Street. So supplementary, the portion of Chalmers Ave from where the Netherby shops Gone off the portion of Chalmers Ave from where the shops are back towards Aiken Street. If, if I'm sorry, but if you call that completed and to a satisfactory level, I would be very disappointed. Has anyone been to inspect that reinstatement of the road there? Yeah, so the project was completed, or the reinstatement was completed last week, and uh, the weather wasn't ideal, I have to admit that. Um, and straight after that, we had a heavy downpour over the weekend, and that resulted in potholes and that. 
or, or potholes. So we went back to ACL and we noticed it on Monday morning. We went back to ACL and uh, that filled all the potholes. Um, as mentioned earlier, we haven't issued the practical completion. And even if we issue the practical completion, the defects liability period is still 12 months, which means if anything goes wrong in the next 12 months, they'll still be responsible uh, for fixing it. Supplementary again. So can I ask, are you happy with the way that road has been reinstated as it is now? As it is now, um, once they've, after they've filled in the older which, which they have now done, yes. yes. Um, and, and yeah, I am happy with it, and so is our roading team. All I can say, no wonder our citizens. citizens tell us what our roads are like. I'm sorry, that is a disgrace. Uh, Councillor Reveley. Uh, yes. Just going to ask about the, the irrigation bores hit in the domain that just used for irrigation. Will they have uh, caps on bore heads done in time? Uh, no, the the. Uh, the old bores uh, in the domain that the, the domain use for irrigation, um, they're not part of the raising project. Uh, in farmer land, farmer land, any of those ones is an opportunity to uh, contaminate, are supposed to be closed off, so they're not going to be, they're still going to be used, but they're not going to be capped. Is that correct? Yeah, so we're, we've got a, we're doing some, uh, some other work. You'll notice we're talking about um, the uh, water supply protection zones work. Um, so we're doing another uh, bit of work which might identify some remedial work required to those bores, but at this point they're not part of the raising project. Um, that other, whatever that uh, additional work required, we'll look at that as a separate issue. Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you, and I'm just following on from Councillor Alice about Chalmers Avenue. I've had several people comment to me too about that piece of road and asking is that the final seal after all the road works and the piping work has been done and I'm sorry I have to agree with him that if that's a reflection of, of our work our reputation will not be upheld. Mr McCann, Lord Pratt. Oh, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, through you Mr Chair to Shamala and I too wish to echo the sentiments of Councillor Alice and Councillor Rawlinson. Um, I know that some years ago Will Street was, the pipe was reinstated and the road has not been as smooth as it was. Harrison Street has had the same treatment and the same problem. And when we talk about, and now Chalmers Avenue, and when we talk about reinstatement to what it was, that is the expectation of the people. So while we are talking about meeting your requirements or meeting Roding's requirements, can I just underline the sentiment that's just been stated, it is not meeting the requirements of the community. Okay. Through the Chair, if I can just discuss that very item. Um, it is a problem that we really are, are concerned about. Um, this particular work this weekend was poorly done. Uh, it was done when it was exceptionally wet. We had a lot of rain on the weekend and we had potholes forming on, on, over the weekend on Sunday and Monday. Um, that particular pipe is, is laid three metres deep, very deep trench, um, difficult circumstances to, to compact and get, get a satisfactory surface for roading and, and, and surfacing. Uh, but having said that, it, it, it's not acceptable that it breaks up like that. So certainly that it is, a, is an issue and ACL did apologise and they have addressed it immediately. But the problem that we have here, with it, particularly in the other roads that you mentioned, is we're digging up these, these roads to put pipelines and we're reinstating where the pipeline is, where the trench is. And if the road is a certain age, whatever you're gonna replace is a brand new surface for a strip, but you've got on either side an aging road that should possibly get re resurfaced at some stage and it would be ideal to do that at the time. Um, so we, we do have problems where we are replacing pipelines in these road surfaces. Um, that is one issue, um, but at the same time we are aware of uh, quality and supervising the quality and the reinstatement of these trenches and we have had issues over the past and we are doing our best to try and address those. <coughs> no further questions? Drinking water? Mm. Councillor Bell? Oh, uh, thank you Mr Chair. Um, my question is about roads. 
Can I still ask a question? No, not yet. No, we're not on the road yet. We're oh, just... No, I mean the, um, the footpath. You know, we're not there yet either. We're just on water at the moment. We'll get there in a minute. <laughs> no questions on... We'll go on to page 21, water safety plans. Any questions of Mr Guthrie on this subject? The government still haven't finally come out with their plan yet, have they, regarding the three waters or two waters or wherever it is, so... Page 22, water meter installations and statistics. Councillor Ellis. Thank you. Just on the water meter installations, and we were just given some figures this morning for um, this afternoon for running the pipeline down Beach Road. That figure will include those each of those properties having a water meter as well. Thank you, Councillor Rollinson. Thank you. Just a question regarding the the water leaks that were discovered on private properties when you were doing the metering. Is that the responsibility then of the property owner? Or does it yes, through go the, right to the house? <laughs> yes, so through the chair. Yeah, that if we identify um, a water leak within those uh, residential meters, it is the property owner's responsibility to fix those leaks. Um, what it's effectively saying is that the the consumption that's occurring is associated with a leak on property. Mm. Thank you. So from the the gateway in, it's the householder <coughs> responsibility because it's quite concerning to see how many the high percentage of leaks that are there. Mm. Yeah, well, as noted in the report, it, it surprised me too. Mm. So uh, I, I think it's um, it's just really uh, another highlight of the benefit of measuring things. Um, you, you can't um, conserve what you don't measure. So. Councillor Brown. Thank you, sir. We've got some figures there on water usage litres per day. Um, are, are they good? Are they bad? Or... What are they? There's no comparison to what they should be, perhaps. Well, to be honest, I, I don't know if they're good, bad or otherwise. Um, the, it's a pretty small sample size at this point. So, I, I, again, I made the point in the report, uh, I wouldn't want to be drawing too many conclusions at this point. Um, I, I think it's uh, just of interest that we're, they are, you know, within reason, they're pretty close um, from street to street. Um, one of the things that we will do as the sample size uh, gets larger um, is that we'll start doing some uh, sort of deeper analysis, um, maybe looking at different parts of town um, and seeing whether or not that has an influence on water use. Um, eventually, we could potentially go around to actually profiling, um, you know, households to work out whether or not, you know, uh, whether what that household uses compared to other similar households. Uh, but that's that's down the track. We, we need a much bigger sample size to make it uh, worthwhile. Councillor Lovett. I'm just looking at, you know, at air leaks, it's a, it's a good time really to think of the future, putting in metering. But the, the leaks that are happening, are they in older properties, older homes, or new ones? Is there any kind of you know old pipe work? Is, have you looked at that? Uh, no, I haven't looked at it specifically, but my, my guess it would be it's probably typically older houses. Um, we, we've got a fairly active renewal program, um, and we're putting in new pipework, which is going to have an 80-year life, um, but these are existing houses that could be 40, 50, 60 years old, so uh, very likely. Yes, I've got a question. It's... I disappointed the term. The times are not the same. I was interested to get some of these figures, but you can't compare one period against another period for different months, and they've got to be the same year, because if it's a very dry spring, you can't compare one part of town with another part of town. So it's all got to be relevant. Um, and to me, if there's leaks on a property, that's what the property's using. Why take out? people in residential C that have got leaks with residential D may not have leaks but the water consumption might be exactly the same so to me you've got to have the month time the period the, the same if you're going to compare 
Yeah, well, through the chair. So uh, certainly, I, I would agree. If we were going to do uh, any substantial analysis and, and potentially use that for the development of policy, we, we would do a lot more. We'd put a lot more rigour around this information, um, and certainly aligning the periods would be one thing. Making sure they are consistent across the, the whole data set. Um, in, in terms of the for the purposes of what I was doing here, um, the only reason I uh, just um, took the leaks out of the analysis was simply because they really did skew what the result was. They weren't actually telling us what we were asked to provide, which was, what does a typical house use? Um, the, the leak is really um, not, it's masking that, act, that answer. So that's, that's the simple reason why it was taken out. The other question, I think it's an anomaly that new houses are going in and subdivisions that have started in previous and they've not got metres. I thought that every new house from when we made the policy had a metre, but Braybrook, Lockley, Oakley, Tarbottons, Residential C, none of them that have been built in the last year or two have got metres. Brand new houses going in now with no metres. And I thought our policy was that every new house had a metre. Yeah, so the, the, the policy is each every new connection has a metre. So any new connections from when we implemented that arrangement um, was that they would have a metre. But the house gets built sometime after that. So in the example of those ex developments you're talking about, they were approved prior to that um, policy or that decision of council. So Braybrook, there are new builds going on in Braybrook right now, but the connections were probably they're upwards of three years old now. They were constructed and vested some time ago under a different regime. To now, me... We, we can... Uh, sorry, just uh, further. I, I mean, we can put metres on retrospectively to those properties, if that's your wish, but we haven't budgeted to do that, and that would be at council's cost. I thought it was the developer... We made the policy the developer put the metre on as yes. part of his connection. Yes, that's right, and we're doing that now... But for a lot of those developments you mentioned, they've been done, constructed some time ago and vested with council already. That's where I differ with you. I think a connection is when the house connects to our pipe, yeah. not when it's put in, not when the pipe's put into the ground out in the street. The connection is when the house yes. connects to the pipe. O okay, but that's fine. But there's no function, no, no connection application done at that point where we can apply a requirement for a water meter. Excuse me, Mr Chairman, I have a question for you. Yes, Are yeah. you asking that we review the policy? Is that what you're asking, that at the next bylaw on policy? Or I thought we had made a policy that all new houses, regardless of when the, the su subdivision started, every new house so, from when we made our long-term plan had to have a metre on so it. So, Councillor Wilson, you may recall when we talked about alfresco dining, we made a policy that said there would be a clear access way and we as the council imagined that that was a straight line. When the staff implemented it, we understood after a couple of implementations that they had a different understanding. May I, cons may I suggest that we put it on the table at the next bylaw on policy to review the statement and check that we have clarification on the wording? Yes, sir. Page 23, any comment on end-of-year end year performance on drinking water? Page 24. Interesting consumption figures there per person, per resident for the year. 6.9, wastewater. End-of-year performance updates on both pages. Stormwater, 6.10. Page 26, end-of-year performance stormwater. Councillor Brown. Just on network-wide stormwater consents. Um, we're going to go for Methven and Rakai now. Didn't we go for district-wide 
stormwater consents early on? No, so it was a Ashburton network wide consent. So um, I don't think there's been many councils applied a, applied for a district wide uh, approach. Uh, I've got a question. We have got consent to renew the West Street stormwater pipe, haven't we, and a wetland at the river? Where does that sit? No, so the, the intention was to get our network wide consent. Um, and there was a view that we would be able to use that once it's been granted uh, to cover that capital project. Um, now, I've just mentioned in there that we've actually got that consent, so um, the applicability of that to the capital project hasn't been tested yet, but we'll be looking to do that fairly sh shortly. District Water Management. We have a meeting on the... First or second of second of August, Friday, tomorrow week. Councillor Brown, that, that's great. You've got the second of August meeting set, and you've got the agenda set. What you're going to do? Set the next meeting a week later and get into it. <laughs> you're late. You're dragging the chain. Uh, Some of it wasn't our fault, actually. Some of the participants were took a long time to get a. They were keen to be involved, but when you said send us a name, it took quite a while. Oh, Councillor Reveley. Yeah, it's uh, much, much the same lines. When, we, when could we expect that we were going to have some results come back from this? It's a good long time ago since we said if participants don't want to mm. turn up to a meeting, they could hold this project up for another two or three mm. damn years. And that's quite disturbing. Uh, we get into a really dry time, really dry time to find, find water and some of those things. So could we really put some pressure on? I imagine before I left Council we're going to get this. I started 15 years ago here, and uh, we thought we nearly had it then. And it looks like it could be another few years away. Through you, Mr Chairman, could I, could I just res respond to that? So it's been frustrating for us getting this group together, uh, but now it is together. We too uh, have great expectations that they will work swiftly to make progress. Uh, and rest assured that if the group... Uh, is unable to meet as often as we would like or can't make the progress in the manner that we would expect, we will come back to Council uh, to talk to you about that. Uh, because it, I agree completely, and it's, I know it's been a frustration to Andy that the time taken to get the group together uh, has been as long as it has. So we're, we, we understand completely your frustration. Because that group, the first part of it, doesn't have too many people with used stock water. Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. I wish to support the two previous speakers. There has been a delay and I'm excited that we can get stuck into it. Um, I do, however, have a question around the Ashburton Zone Committee. So at the meeting of the 25th of June, firstly I wish to thank the Chief Executive and Mr McCann for um, an officer in attendance and we seem to be alternating between Mr Guthrie and Mr Askin. Um, there were a couple of questions, Councillor Wilson as our representative, that came up at that zone committee that ADC were going to report to the next meeting, which I understand has now been delayed because you've been advised that there is no subject matter. But I thought there were a couple of questions for ADC staff to report back to the next zone committee. I haven't got a copy of those minutes. Do you remember what it was? Um, I thought firstly, um, <coughs> and there were other councillors in the room, I thought one was in regards to the stormwater the stormwater and also um, the stock water closures and where we're at. Yeah, that's, that's why I actually asked Mr Guthrie about the consents for the stormwater. Um, we were asked what were we doing regarding stormwater. Well, once we do the West Street and the wetland, that will cover our obligations there. But it a bit still depends on what the government decide we have to do or not have to do. Yeah, if there is, uh, through the chair, if there is some uh, stuff that we need to provide the zone committee, um, we're happy to do that. I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll follow that up. So again, through you, Mr Chairman, um, Carol McTamini is the secretary for that committee, and I'm sure those minutes would be available, but there, it was specifically mentioned that you would be coming to present, and now I understand it's been delayed a month. Councillor Brown? Um, on the zone committee side of it, the... Um, 
Zoning Committee has implemented it, or ECAN has implemented a review of the consents on the Ashburton River. And we had a meeting which um, was thoroughly attended at the Hotel Ashburton for um, affected um, consent holders. Council has three consents that are affected. What are we doing with our affected consents? Yeah, through the chair. So um, we have got, um, we've been advised of the, the affected consents. Um, at this point in time, uh, we will probably follow the process that has been offered to us, which is we are allowed to propose uh, different conditions. Uh, the, the Regional Council have proposed some to us. Um, for instance, uh, the Meth and Springfield consent uh, for the uh, Stockwater uh, water supply uh, consent. Um, there is a condition requiring us uh, to uh, cease uh, water for dairy uh, washdown. Uh, there is no, there is no mechanism for us to do that. Um, so we are affected with this uh, consent review, and we would probably propose to go back to them and saying uh, we don't like your condition. Uh, we propose no condition in that vein. Uh, and see where we end up. Councillor Brown. And the ocean farm consent for irrigation? Yeah, so the, the ocean farm consent, we, we had a discussion at officer level at this point. Um, we haven't actually required that uh, very much uh, in recent years. Um, so I'm not sure, we haven't done any analysis to work out whether or not there is a, a, a massive impl uh, implication to us in terms of our operation. Uh, we will continue to, we will do that analysis uh, and then we'll make a call on uh, what we do with that one as well. Um, the other one that was affected, the other consent uh, that I'm aware is affected is the irrigation consent that we had uh, in our back pocket uh, for our discussions with the irrigators. Uh, that was that sort of uh, provisional consent that we had off to the side. Um, that one is probably firmly trapped by the consent review. There's probably not a lot of room to move with that one. Does any of this need to come back to council for um, review? Because the implications that will be put on or could be put on will be lasting for a long, long time. I believe that uh, as a zone committee representative, the 30th of this month, every consent holder that is going to be involved will get correspondence mm. individually. Yeah. Mm. They've got it already? Yes, yes we have. Yeah. Oh I see, I thought it was all going to be on the 30th. So my question is do we roll over and accept it or do we, and as Councillor Minister Guthrie said, they're going to not. But what role do we play as governance in those conditions? Because it's going to have a long lasting effect on the benefit of the district or those consents. I would understand that the management would look at the conditions that ECAN are wanting us to do, and if they're not happy, they would write a report and come to the council to say, are you prepared to accept these conditions or not? Is that... Yeah, perhaps Andy can explain uh, further. Well, look, I mean, we will bat hard for our corner, um, but there will be... Um, there will be some that we might not win. Um, but I, I, we're more than happy as officers to bring something to the committee to, for, the, for uh, an approach for the committee to consider. Um, but uh, ordinarily, for consent condition, um, we would typically only report that after the fact. Um, uh, for, you know, for a new development, um, we're reviewing consent conditions regularly uh, as part of our day-to-day -day work. We wouldn't ordinarily bring them uh, in front of council. But in this particular case, it's a, it's a special case. Maybe we could. Yeah, through the chair, if, there, if there's certainly budget implications or big implications, we would certainly bring them to council for decision. Um, and in this case, if that is the case, uh, we would do so. Well, the reason I'm raising it, there's 90 consents out there which are being reviewed. The other 87, at least three, from other people are concerned about the implications for their businesses going forward, we should be too. If those 87 are, then we should be too, um, one way or the other. 
Councillor Price. Thank you. I just want to go back to Andy's comment about um, stock water being used for dairy washdown. Now, I've just got some questions around this. So is this something that we permit people to do with stock water, or is the issue, and is that why you're opposing it, or is it a case that we can't verify the compliance and that's why you're um, opposing it? Yeah, so, uh, well, just to clarify, so the meth in Springfield, for all intents and purposes, is a water supply, and it's uh, delivered to the customers by a restriction, uh, through a, a restrictor. Um, we've got no way of knowing how they operate and what they're using that water for, um, but they, only, they are only limited to a certain volume a, uh, a day uh, through the restrictor. Um, the difficulty with the proposed consent condition that uh, ECAN have put through, uh, we've got no way of complying with it. We could write to people and say, uh, we're on restriction, you're not allowed to use it for your dairy washdown, but we're not going to be able to go and enforce that. Uh, it would be uh, practically impossible. So when we, supplementary, so when we supply stock water to property owners, do we have any kind of terms of agreement that, that they sign with us? Uh, well, it, it's a water supply. It's basically covered under the bylaws now. It's under the drinking water, the, the water supply bylaw. And does that include a condition that it shouldn't be used for dairy washdown? Uh, I think it's silent on dairy washdown specifically as an activity. So perhaps we need to review that policy as well. Well, we're providing stock water. That's not dairy washdown. Sorry, just to clarify, the Methven Springfield is a water supply. Um, we, we're not allowed to call it a stock water scheme because it's reticulated and it's regarded as a, a water supply. Um, so it's used for many purposes on farm. But the volumes are quite small, aren't they? Like, the, 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 they're restricted. It, it won't allow probably wash down anyway. Uh, look, I'm not aware of the, the level of water they would need, to be honest. Um, uh, the, uh, the, I think the primary issue from our point of view is that it would be impossible for us to police. Could I just ask one... So this, your statement about um, that condition only applied to the Methven Springfield... Right, sorry, OK, I misunderstood. Further questions? Thank you, Andy. Kamal, we'll now go to 6.12, Roding. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr Firth. Seeing you were first here this afternoon. 6.12.1, any questions? I did have a question in pre-agenda that I was disappointed that we have to go back three years to get people that resurface our roads to get them to come and do it again, sort of thing. Because the Mayfield-Lismore Road, it is going to be done, and Mr Firth said the conditions were... That what the council want is possibly more than the contractor thought they could get away with, but, I mean, obviously, you retain some of the contracts so that they do come back and fix it properly. Any questions on page 28? Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Through you to Mr Firth. Um, Mr Firth, I'm just reading about contract C655, the supply and installation of LED streetlights. And um, we started September 2018. My recollection at the time was we were hoping to be all done by December the same year. And I read here that there are still some lanterns to be installed as part of the power undergrounding. Do you have a um, tentative date for completion? Uh, not for the undergrounding side of things, um, but as far as the LED contract was concerned, we were well and truly aware that uh, there'd be certain areas of the town that EA networks were going to be doing undergrounding. So we didn't include those particular lights in the LED contract. Um, so that's the situation there. 
Councillor Brown. Um, like the last meeting, I asked for just a wee update on State Highway 1, what was work was going to happen there, not our business, but just as in, for information, there's nothing there on State Highway 1 at this stage. And also 612.3, RDR Bridges, I think, I thought you'd had the meeting with them and it all been sorted. It doesn't mention that there, with RDR around the bridges and the shutdown, etc, etc. Uh, at this point in time, as far as the RDR bridges are concerned, we are working with GHD, and we hope to go to tender very shortly on those bridges. So um, the RDR um, situation is uh, being discussed, and we're reasonably comfortable to go ahead with the contract at the stage. Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman, but I was actually behind Councillor Brown. Oh. Councillor Brown. Go on, Madam Mayor. Um, so, Mr Chairman, my question is through you, please, to Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown, as your representative at the Regional Transport Committee, and in regards to your question about State Highway 1, are you referring to the safety features that were planned? Um, no, just what, in what work is planned on State Highway 1. Just for our information and the people's information. Okay, so not specifically the safety features? No, which no, no. So I understand there's work going to be done on the Churchy Railway crossing. Um, but that could be publicised somewhere, so people get aware the work's going to be done. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, Brian, just for my information, if I can, retention, how much of a contract is it? Is it 20% or is it a figure or is it worthwhile for those guys to come back or not? It all depends on the contract. Uh, but for the resurfacing contract, generally it's a contract in the vicinity of three and a half million dollars or thereabouts. Uh, for the first million, we take 10 per cent, uh, up to the, that must be for the first two million, because we up to 200,000, it's 10 per cent. Then it becomes 5 per cent for the next part, and then it becomes two and a half per cent for the next bit, so. <coughs> Councillor Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is um, a general question of our uh, quality of our roads. How come the rural roads, we're always talking about potholes and things like that, and then the state higher one, we'd, we don't get that. Are we using poor quality material, or what is the reason why we're always doing up our roads? We blame on the weather, we blame on the... Why? Are they different quality of materials being used? If you're talking about the quality of our network, um, I can show you national figures of performance that show our network is in very good condition. If you're talking about the community perception of the network, mm -hmm. that is a different animal. Um, the perception uh, is that the network is in poor condition. Uh, to give you an example, when we started the um, current maintenance contract that we have, and we're, we're in year, about to go into year five of that particular contract, um, back when it started, we estimated that we would be doing approximately 8,000 square metres of dig-outs on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Currently we have listed in our books 50,000 square metres to be done. Now that is a huge amount in comparison to the 8,000 that we estimated some four or five years ago. Mm. Now in that time the only thing that's changed has been the um, heavy vehicles on the in the district. We've gone from a gross laden weight of 44 tonnes to a gross laden weight now, in some instances up to 65 tonnes. Uh, a lot of the dairy tankers floating around the district on a regular basis are 58 tonnes. Now, a lot of that traffic was not on the network five, six to five years, uh, six to ten years ago. It is, as the land use in the district has changed, the traffic volumes have changed, we are dealing with a much heavier uh, animal on our network, and it's causing damage to the network that we can't quite catch up with at this point in time. Uh, you would notice at the start of the year we said uh, 
we were lucky. We finally got the million dollars per year that we wanted from NZTA. Uh, so it took us six years to get to that level. We're six years behind the eight ball. We're catching up fast, but we're still behind. Uh, having said that there's still 50,000 to be done, though, 50,000 when you consider that we've got in our sealed network 1,560 k's, if you take an average width of that road length of being, say, six and a half metres, and that's light because most of them are a bit more than that, um, multiply that together and then work out what 50,000 uh, squares is, you'll find that the percentage is quite small. So that we have to, when we go to try and... Um, put our case to NZTA, we have to show that a particular section of road that we want to strengthen and do up and put a lot of money into has the faults at least and everything else, that he, uh, defects that we have to fix, has to be greater than 10%. In a lot of cases, we can't do that. And hence, we're just patching, waiting for it to fall apart enough so that we can then get in and do something proper. So that's where we're at. While I've got the opportunity, I'll also say that uh, right at the start of the year, we were concerned that with the amount of money that we had, that we would struggle to get through the program. And I must you know, congratulate my team and also the contractors out there. We've managed to get through that program, and um, I think we're catching up. Um, that's my opinion, and uh, I'll st stand by it. Uh, give us another year. Uh, hopefully without the rainfall that we've had in the last couple of years, uh, I think we'll be starting to get really on top of it. But that's where we're at at this stage, and that's the reason why we're where we're at. Yes, that's excellent. Some, in the past, I know sometimes councillors are critical of the roading team that don't use the total amount that's available, so you've done a good job. Unsubsidised roading, the popular road extension. We've already covered the Moronan and Road Bridge. Footpaths, Councillor Rebley. Uh, yeah, just a, one on the footpaths. The, why, the curb and, footpaths to Curban Channel, major change of scope. Why, what, what, what are we talking about there? That we, uh, this, during, during, during work on this, why, was, why are we talking about a major change? Is, is, was, is, is a greater amount of work or...? Why wasn't it identified before the contract went out? I'm not quite sure just exactly why we're uh, talking about major changes, but we have um, pulled them off various sites because we know that um, there's some other work coming up in that area uh, and put them into other areas. Um, if you look at uh, Nixon Street, for argument's sake, where we've done a new footpath curb and channel. There's a piece of approximately 20 metres frontage of a subdivision that's going to go ahead very shortly. Uh, he, he came to us and said we're putting in this subdivision in the, the next 12 months or whatever. Uh, we don't want to be crossing over a brand new footpath curb and channel. So there's a gap and people would think, well, why the hell would we leave that? But that's the reason behind it. So there's things like this that are happening all the time that changes our program as we move forward and uh, we try and work into that type of situation, basically. Councillor Rollinson. Thank you, and I know I'm always talking about lichen on footpaths, <laughs> but I look forward to seeing better results from the spraying because there's parts of Tinwall that it may look fine in the dry weather. The moment you get a little bit of mist or drizzle overnight, the lichen just swells up and it's green and slippery again, and it, to be honest, it's not getting any better. Yes, we're well and truly aware that we've got problems with the lichen. There's no two ways about that. Uh, we're trying different sprays. We're trying different methodologies. Uh, we're stuck with the current contract, which says that this is what you want, we want you to do. Um, we're getting that changed, uh, and we're working through it. One of the reasons why the lichen's there is that there's just not enough foot traffic. Councillor <laughs> <laughs> mm. Ellis? Thank you, and I'd just through you like to congratulate the new contractor we have doing the, the footpaths now and, and the, 
the grass berms that go with those. Um, in, in fact, some ways the standard there works embarrassing when you go down Harrison Street or Aiken Street and one company's done one side of the road and a different company's done the other. Um, what we were prepared to accept before and what we will accept now is so different, it's, it's not funny. So I just through you, I'd like to congratulate uh, Rooney's because I think they're doing an exceptional job out there and they are taking a pride in what they're doing and, and going the extra mile to make sure it is good. Page 30, end of year performance. We already have heard it's not good with the resident survey, but... Councillor Brown. Just on the um, council contractors respond to transport transportation network failures, and two years ago it was 31%, the target 75, and this year it was 53, which is better, but still short of the uh, 75. Uh, are there any penalties on the contractor for not achieving the 75? Uh, it's not so much that. Um, this whole business of uh, the contractor response and our response uh, is in discussion with DIA at this point, or not DIA, but the auditor. Uh, DIA want us to have certain f criteria. Um, we think we've got that criteria. Audit don't agree, um, and at this point we're just trying to work out just exactly what is considered to be a CRM completion as far as council side of it is concerned. And it's similar to what was mentioned earlier, um, I think it was um, with David Askin, was mentioning similar type of things, and this is where we're having a... a a good discussion with our auditors and DIA trying to sort out what is how it's measured throughout the country and other areas and trying to get a standard in place that is typical of other areas and then put a response time to that that we can um, work to or work around or work with basically. So these figures I am <coughs> doubtful that they mean a great deal at this point in time through the chair and that what that's been referring to is there's a difference in the contractor performance measure and our performance measure and that's what we're working on trying to align those this difference is reflecting that so whereas the contract is probably meeting their time frame it's not meeting our time frame from the minute the request comes to our customer service desk upcoming tenders 6.16 Vandalism, we we'll seem to get a little bit. Methven Community Board. Oh, sorry, Councillor Price. I was just going to ask about Beach Road. Is that all the length of Beach Road from the roundabout through to the town boundary? Yes. Uh, yes, it's to the um, 70k sign, basically. Yep. Okay, thank you. Methven Community Board, the three recommendations there. Councillor McMillan, you've got any comments on the first one? Uh, no, no comments. It's just um, something that came up at our last Community Board meeting, so um, it's just... Um, I'm is, happy to move it. Is, no, well, is it about the times they have boiled water? I believe we're putting in... What's the thing to stop? Can you UV? Thanks, Brian. That, that'll, I think that'll it all was, be... It wasn't about oil water. This particular... <coughs> was it about storage? It was about storage. storage and just with the town growth, have we got enough? Yeah. Mr Chairman, I was also at the meeting and my recollection was, and Mr Brake was there and might be able to help us out, um, my recollection was we were talking about the activity management plan and what's in the long-term plan for water uh, in the Methven area, and the Methven Community Board seemed unaware of what the activity management plan was and how it came into our thinking, and I think it was more of an educational request about how the board can better understand how um, Mr Guthrie and his team do their job. Yeah, so um, through the Chair, I've uh, provided a bit of a beefy item to the next... 
uh, board meeting uh, in the agenda. Um, and I've also uh, provided some, uh, appended some relevant extracts from the current LTP, which I'm pretty hopeful will explain just where we sit with the, the scheme. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor so McMillan. I'll move that recommendation. Do you want me to read it out? Who does that go to? Well, the point of clarification, if with Andy's answer then, if it's all going to the board, is there a need for this recommendation now? Yeah. He's about to supply all that information they're looking for. Is it procedural though? Or does it? No? You already put it in the agenda. I don't think so. So I'll move, move it. I'll second it. Any discussion? If not, all in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary, carried. Speed limit review on three, three roads. Mr. I can answer that, Mr. Chairman. Yes, they will be included in the work that we're doing for the district-wide uh, speed limit review should, that will come up in the next couple of months, hopefully. Councillor McMillan. Thank you. And the reason why this is a recommendation from the community board is just so that um, council were aware that um, we were all in agreement for these three roads to, to be reviewed. So I'd like to move that recommendation as well, please. I'll second it. Councillor Reveley seconded it. Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Happy to support it. I'm just, um, I'm a little confused because I, I thought we talked about speed limits. I thought we weren't doing them. I'm pleased we are doing a district wide, but I'm, I'm just a little confused. Maybe I got lost somewhere on the way. Yep. We've since decided we're doing a district wide one. Is that correct? <coughs> um, we're doing a review along the normal process of our bylaw. We're not at this stage looking at the um, megadata uh, and the implications of that data that has come through from through NZTA, etc. Excellent. I'm really pleased to hear that. Thank you. Councillor Reveley? Yeah, that was just, just to check that the staff here had the same roads before that board went out. So, so it was just to check to make sure that those were the same roads. I'm pretty certain they did, but rather than, rather than hearsay, just that's... All in favour of that second recommendation, please say aye. aye. Contrary, carried. Methven Cemetery tree removal. Councillor Price. I'd just like to ask some questions about that. Um, if the trees have been removed, are they, are they going to be, uh, is it going to be replanted? And if not, are there implications on the ETS? Without David Askin here, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Um, was there any discussion on that at the Meth and Community Board? Yes. Because Dave Askin was present, was he? Yep. 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 It, it's, it's working with the present staff to see what can happen, and that's how it will happen. The board has passed it over over to the uh, the uh, council's park staff and the forester to work with the various people that need to be, and it'll be replanted probably in natives to protect the trees, what are, the, what are already there. There's some, some good specimens there, and they're taking out some old pines. Councillor Ellis. Thank you. Um, I see, and I'm in support of it, the income is returned to the Meffin Cemetery account, so that's where the costs will also come from for the removal yes. of the trees. Could be a negative. Methven Dog Park was already been mentioned, I think, too, Mr. Askin, about the extra mowing. What was it, one point something hectares? Well, that's quite a lot. Do you want me to oh. move that recommendation on the Do you want to, you... cemetery? Yes. I'll move the I'll recommendation move. on the Methven Cemetery tree. Councillor Lovett. Councillor Lovett. Second it. All in favour, all in favour, please say aye. aye. Country, carried.
Ethan Dog Park. Reports from the Joint Committee, Expert in Total Mobility. Councillor Urquhart was present. Anything further to report there? Not really, except I think taxi charges have gone up a bit, but uh, uh, Councillor Rawlinson, did you have anything to add? I did. Um, the subject arose... Oh, that's right. Oh, sorry. You're finished? Yeah, no, that's fine, Lydia. I think what um, Councillor Rawlinson's about to say, the subject of the looking after patients that are tipped out of the hospital at some sort of different hours, mostly at night, uh, has been of concern and there's been a letter sent to the Canterbury Health Board to try and address that, that they're, especially elderly patients that they're properly looked after, um, you know, when they are sent home, say 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night or something. Uh, the, the older people are a little bit reluctant to say, you know, they need a taxi or they need a ride. They tend to say, I'll be fine, dear. Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you, and I do attend because it fits in nicely with my urban roading chair. Um, there is another point that arose, and it was regarding the post office closing and people now using the postal centre at Paper Plus as their postal centre, and apparently a lot of elderly pay their accounts there, and the comment arose that they're finding it difficult to get parking close to Paper Plus. So they asked if there could be a disability park put there, and I've spoken to Mr McCann about there's a disused cycle um, place there. You'll see yellow markings on the road. I think it's outside the flower shop or in that vicinity. And I've asked Mr McCann if that could be used as a disability park for people to do what they would like to do at Paper Plus. So Neil's just advised today that to total mobility just need to simply write into council and ask for that and hopefully it can be granted. Yeah. No further comments? I'll close the general part of the meeting. We'll now go into the in committee part. If you'd like to move, we go into the committee. Councillor Ellis, seconded Councillor Bell. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary, carried. Ruben just says wait for Yes, yes. <laughs>